Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another session of DocSpot Live. Uh, today, we have a very interesting topic and a very interesting guest. Uh, we have Kaushik Barua here, who's an honorary wildlife warden of uh, the state of Assam. And he specializes in rescue and uh, translocation of large mammals such as elephants and rhinos. And he's also involved in the training and deployment of military working dogs for anti-poaching activities. So, hi, Kaushik. Welcome to DocSport. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to have you. So, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, your bio uh, only was so long. It took me a couple of uh, seconds there to get through it. So, you know, there's a lot of ground to cover for us during this life. So, um, you know, you grew up with dogs and elephants, so let's start from that. How did you become a wildlife uh, conservationist? You know, when, when I was born, you know, it was like the early 70s. And, you know, yeah. 70s, Guwahati was uh, a simple town. It's not the bustling city. So, and, and you know, I was raised, rather me and my brother, we were raised between dogs and elephants. Like, you know, there were dogs in front of the house, there were elephants in the back courtyard. Uh, wow. my, my father's family was into elephants, so naturally we had elephants and dogs were something which my father and my mother liked. And as a result, you know, we, we grew up with these two animals. Or rather, you know, whenever, you know, people ask me like, you know, you, you have them as pets. I said, no, these are the members of my extended family. And, and there were times in, you know, when, when puppies were there and we were given on, we were given conflicts on the steel bowls on the table. And on the ground, there would be a line of little bowls with the puppies having out there. So we never, differ I mean, my mom never differentiated between, you know, us and the dogs. For her, for her, you know, <laughs> dogs were babies. Wow. And, you know, and elephants were there, you know, they used to come in every uh, April because that's the time, you know, elephant capture operations used to get over and they used to stay home till around October. And, you know, as you get exposed to a certain thing over and over a period of time, you know, you start actually learning about it. You know, in, inquisitiveness, inquisitiveness actually gets into you and you, you start, you know, thinking yeah. about it, learning about it. And that's, you know, one fine day I said, no, something needs to be done about it. Very interesting. So, I mean, uh, very interesting childhood right there. You know, most of us, we just say we have dogs or cats and now like you have <laughs> elephants. So, how you chose to be a wildlife conservationist, like, I mean, at what age did you decide that? And... Uh, you know, how did it so come from? Till the age of 18, you know, I, I kept on seeing them. Dogs were always there in the house. Dogs are still in the house. Uh, yeah. Till the age of 18, you know, elephants were somewhat still in and around the house that I grew up in. So, but in between when I was in college, you know, it, it they, they actually, you know, I mean, I was a bit away from them because college, you know, you need, you have a different, you know, agenda. But yeah. after college, when I started joining my dad's work, my dad was into construction. And these okay. constructions were, you know, deep into thickets, forests. So we used to move the elephants and I used to be based out from the camp, the side camps. So mm -hmm. then on, you know, again, uh, my association with the elephants started. And uh, then, then, you know, what happened since my dad used to, I mean, my, my, like I said, my paternal family used to catch elephants. You know, they were the largest elephant catchers in the world, actually. They used to supply, wow, to, the okay. British, they, yeah, they used to supply to the British Army, the, uh, the Bombay Burma Trading Company in Myanmar now. So elephants were there in the family, it's been a part of the family. And, you know, I also engaged in the elephant capture, but I did not like it. I mean, you know, then I said that that was the day I said, I mean, I'll tell you why. What happens, a boy, when he sees his dad, he tries to, you know, do whatever his dad does. And it looks very macho, you know, you, you're catching elephants, nothing of that sort, actually. You know, mm -hmm. when I did that, it's not that I repented. I said, no, nothing, nothing doing. Man. You shouldn't do this. I mean, there are other ways that you can conserve these animals, these family members. So I started, you know, using my elephants to, you know, conserve their own species. I wow. learned about them. I read books, you know, I talked to people and slowly I picked up things. I worked with elephants and in the site, you know, I was seeing the elephants almost 24 seven, you know, I mean, for months. Right. So I learned a lot of things. And uh, then one fine day I said, you know, these elephants are the, my elephants or rather our elephants. I'm going to use them for conservation work. So hmm. I started using them as kunkis. You know, kunki is a term used for trained elephants, elephants which are trained okay. in elephant capture. So okay. I started using our kunkis to drive, you know, wild herds when they come into paddy fields. So I started using our elephants to again push them back into the forest, in, in, back from where they came from. And this okay. helped save paddy and helped save them from getting into trouble. Right. 
that's very interesting uh, you know and so how long have you been doing this and how many elephants do you have right now how long i've been i've been uh, you know working for elephants since last uh, 25 years over 25 years actually hmm. and uh, the rhinos last 12 years and uh, yeah and what was the second question i didn't get you uh i said how long have you been doing this and how many elephants do you have right now well how many uh yeah. well i have uh five of my own wow and i actually have nine because four elephant owners they haven't been able to take care of their elephants now i'm taking care of their elephants i mean i made them promise me that they won't you know make their elephants beg or you know get them into any illegal work yeah. so i'm maintaining them on behalf of them actually that's incredible so uh you know i in my introduction i said you're the honorary wildlife warden of the state of assam so what does this title entail and what does it mean you know basically i'm i'm uh you know it's an honorary job the word honorary <laughs> says about it and you know it's it's it makes me a forest officer where you know i can do conservation work and okay. you know i can do awareness work i can even detain if i want to if i see that any illegality oh. is going on that gives me the power yeah. to detain and yeah. i can even file cases and i assist the government in planning and uh, in mitigation of conflict and uh, various other things i mean basically i'm an extended arm of the forest that's it the forest okay. department but how did you go about getting this title like well, like i said i mean this, this is a title this, this is a title that i did not you know uh, look i mean i didn't go in search for or you know my idea was to get this title i mean people saw my work then they recommended me and then one fine day the government says that you know okay we are going to you know appoint you as wildlife warden and you need to work wow <laughs> that's great and uh, you know let's talk about the uh, first line of conservation is that were hunters and lot of uh, actually that's true for the tigers as well most of the hunters became the biggest champions of uh, uh, you know the conservation of the big cats and uh, the tiger project was started by a bunch of uh, ex hunters as well so uh, do you want to talk about this with your experience in this field look i i did i mean assam assam did have a fair share of you know people who engaged in hunting till hunting was permissible and yeah. and these were people who did not do rampant hunt, hunting you know these people took licenses and you know hunted and you know these were these were people i mean whom i would say were the first line of naturalists actually right and they observed the animals you know even if they have to had to go after an animal they observed the animals so you know i actually learned a lot of animal behavior a lot of tracking work from these people you know and i also learned a lot of ecology from these people because these people knew that you know what uh, big mammals big wild mammals required what the needs were right. and how they moved around and what their behavior was so if you take away the word hunters and they became naturalists there's a lot to learn from them actually yeah so uh, did you know any such people personally since your family has been involved with this for a uh, long yeah time? i i i knew i knew i knew uh, i mean i still know few of them i mean i knew yeah. uh, i knew birannam fukon birannam fukon was an elephant catcher and a hunter he used to actually okay. you know destroy proclaimed rogues rogues which were actually proclaimed by the government that they were you know uh, they had killed too many people and so they needed to be you know something needed to be done about them so he was one of them but he taught me a lot of uh he taught me a lot of animal behavior you know how to approach an elephant i mean to see yeah. the signs then his yeah. son was there his son is still there his name is dipen phukon then i learned a lot from other you know guys who engaged uh themselves in the profession of you know elephant capture when elephant capture commercial captures were permissible like yeah. uh, bijanand choudhury was there dinesh choudhury was there and my late father yeah so uh, you know kashik i'm getting a lot of questions so i'm going to take some of them up before we continue sure. with our chat uh, we have sandeep here hi sandeep uh, he is saying nowadays wildlife is adversely affected due to the flood situation in assam are there any steps taken to save animals look first of all first of all i would say floods are needed okay floods are needed because you know what happens is it replenishes the vegetation once the floods go away you know there's new sprouting of vegetation so people say that floods are there i mean you can't do anything yes we can't do anything we stay in a flood plain number one so the whole banaputra basin valley is a flood plain so we have to live with it and as far as you know uh 
rescue is concerned, the effect, I mean, I mean, as far as affecting the animals are concerned, yes, let's take Kaziraga. I'm sure this uh, particular, you know, uh, statement is hinted towards Kaziraga. Kaziraga does has does have floods. It's been having floods. It will have floods in the future. But then, you know, there is Karbi Anglong right opposite to it. So animals do, you know, go into the Karbi Anglong area, which is a higher area. And a lot of uh, highlands have been built now. And, uh, you know, animals do take refuge in the highlands. And on top of that, we have a fantastic, you know, uh, rescue team out there. Uh, we have WTI, the Wildlife Trust of India, whose uh, Center for Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation is there. They do a fantastic yes. job and they're supported yes. by all of us. Yes. So, I have personally I mean, you know, contributed to WTI as well because I saw they were doing a lot of incredible work, you know, and last year the situation was quite bad. From whatever so this I get, it's there, more bad. This year, this year it's more bad. But due yeah, to good planning, you know, good yeah. planning, you know, adversities haven't been to that extent. Yeah. No, but also this year, you know, coronavirus has taken over the news cycle. Last year, it was definitely media was giving it a bit more attention than this year. So you on the ground, you obviously know more about uh, the current situation. Like you're saying, it is worse than last year. So, but you think yeah, it's you worse than last year in terms of floods because we have had three floods. Three bouts of wow. floods have come in, actually, one after another. Okay. And, you know, okay. it's it's going to be almost 60 days that, you know, certain areas would be underwater. So wow. we will have an issue once the uh, the water recedes, but yeah. not to an extent that it won't be manageable. Our park managers are excellent in their job. Right. And then, you know, we are there. We support them wherever needed. Of course, of course. So thank you for answering that, Kaushik. Uh, I have a You're question welcome. here. Uh, Mohammed, Mohammed, uh, about your dog, please uh, refer to Dog Spot's uh, previous uh, chats. If you uh, need some uh, contact, uh, go to our website, dogspot.in. We have a lot of resources there. There are some vets listed there. You can uh, get their help or just wait for another vet session. We can't do this today. It's not a dog show today. We are talking about my life. Uh, Sandeep has another question for you, Kaushik. He's saying, how mm -hmm. elephant keeping is different from dog keeping? Well, Sandeep, dog keeping is much more expensive than elephant keeping nowadays, actually. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't know whether you can see at the back. I have a whole, you know, lot of royal canines stacked up. So you can imagine, you know, how expensive dog keeping is nowadays. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, elephant keeping is, I mean, you definitely need more people. Like, you know, we have, uh, for, per two elephants, we have three people. Yeah. So that in case, wow. you know, one, one, I mean, you know, one extra so that it's on a rooster, you know, he works. And, uh, but, you know, since we work with the, since we work with the government, since we use our elephants for anti depredation work, I mean, food has not been a problem till now because we are allowed to graze in the fringe areas. You know, the elephants are allowed to graze in the fringe areas because we work for the government. And on top yeah. of that, we do give them additional, I mean, sustenance, vitamins and feed. That's okay, but still cheaper than keeping dogs. <laughs> Also, I don't think an elephant will try to kick me out of my own bed like my dog does. <laughs> well, they do actually, you know. Really? I, I spend a lot of time, when I'm in camp, I actually spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, once in a yeah. while, yeah, once in a while, you know, I, I, I have this very bad thing of, you know, when they sleep, I actually, you know, try to go and, you know, see if I lay down in front of, I mean, near them, will they do anything? <laughs> and every now and then they're hitting me with the trunk, you know, and, you know, they're putting dust on my face. You know, they're sniffing me. So, you know, it's the same, but I would say, you know, elephant keeping is cheaper than actually keeping dogs nowadays in the current scenario. Yeah. Uh, Karan is here. Hi, Karan. He's saying, what do you think of tourism in Kaziranga? Look, uh, Karan, I, you know, I, I'll tell you something before, before we get into the tourism thing. I never ride my elephants unless necessary. Okay. It's only when, you know, it's a rescue. I need to be on mm -hmm. top of the elephant and if it's needed that I need to, you know, drive a wild herd and I need to be on top of the elephant, that's the only time I'm, I'm on, on the elephant. So that's one part of your answer. The second part is, you know, when you, when I say tourism, uh, tourism in Kaziranga is great, of course. And in terms of the elephants, look, it's it's uh, been, I think, uh, quite it's been over 10 years that, you know, Kaziranga has been actually, you know, uh, utilizing the services of private elephants for, you know, tourism which I feel is not bad. The reason being rather than begging and these elephants getting into some illegal timber work, it's better that, you know, they are doing something which is, uh, which more or less suits, you know, elephants. Like, you know, they are actually employed till around 10 o'clock in the morning. After that, you know, they go and graze and it's keeping them off trouble. And as a result, 
another thing what is happening is you know you are freeing the government elephants which were being utilized for the uh, tourist work now these elephants can actually you know do the patrolling and you know movement so they are freeing up the government elephants which and they are doing the work they are supposed to do and these are taking the tourists so i see i mean it's a, it's it's a good situation as of now it's much more better than having an elephant out on the road and begging yeah and what is the best time to visit kaziranga kashik since you there uh november december then around late feb and march because that's when the grass is burnt and chances are to see a tiger actually sightings yeah yeah interesting uh i'll take another question here from ceo he's saying hello sir uh, your take on importance of conservation of life forms sitting low in the survival pyramid like frogs and geckos thank you for asking that question actually you know every every species every life form including us is important you know these are all indicators of the biosphere of the ecology one goes missing you know the whole link breaks people don't realize people say that you know i i have a friend who does research on dung beetles you know and and dung yeah. beetles these you know they yeah. they make rolls out of elephant poop and you know and that's an indicator yeah. of what the uh that particular region that he's working on what changes that region is going on so you know i your everything is important frogs geckos dung beetle everything is important one species go missing is a total imbalance of things true true uh i have one more question and it's very amusing so i'm going to take it up karan is saying are kaziranga tigers cooler than panch and madhya pradesh tigers well i i would say your your pench pench tigers are more acquainted to people around them more acquainted to tourists around them and our our tigers are still you know are still wild i mean you know they they still don't see that much of people because we have a huge area and uh grasslands very difficult to spot them uh and and let me tell you something i mean i mean i'm kind of allergic to cats because once we went to rescue something and the tiger almost you know jumped on my lap so you know there is there is a tiger there's 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 nothing known as all tigers are cool and all tigers are white so there's nothing which says there's a soft yeah, tiger or it's a tiger which can go kitty 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 nothing like that no no cool but you know like the mp tigers don't want to meet me personally i've had no luck on all the safaris i've been and i've tried really but uh, maybe i'll try my luck in kazakh you know, tiger sighting is actually luck Yeah, I have brought in like people refuse to get in the jeep with me now. So, <laughs> okay. So I will be talked about elephants. I want to talk about rhinos now. So, what do you do uh -huh. with rhinos, and what? Why do you need to relocate them? And uh, you know, uh, look. Uh, I'll just tell you when you when you talk about a sam, there are two things that you know about it. It's it's yeah. either Kaziranga or the T, right? Yeah. But there are places other than Kaziranga where rhinos were there. Okay, yeah. Manas. It's a biospheric reserve. It's a U. It's a World Heritage Site. Manas, you know, had had uh, rhinos, but due to the uh, insurgency problem, due to social political unrest, rhinos were wiped out. So what we did was, are uh, under a program known as the Indian Rhino Vision 2020, where we actually, you know, visualized and we concepted that we will have 3,000 rhinos in the wild till 2020. Yeah. Uh, we said, let's move. Uh, you know, let's restock Manas with uh, rhinos. so yeah. a group of ngos got together a group of specialists got together a group of super veterinarians got together with led by one of the best you know uh, uh what your forest officers the best forest officers those days and they yeah. were like you know let's go ahead and do it so we had this program going where we re we actually you know picked up rhinos from two places in assam one is kobitora kobitora is another another rhino century 40 kilometers from guwahati it's got the highest concentration of rhinos 16 square kilometers you have 100 plus rhinos so we picked up around 10 from there and we picked up 10 from kaziranga we put them in manas at manas and manas did see poaching after that we have had poaching but you know and then wti had the rescued rhinos we put those rescued rhinos in even after poaching we have around 35 plus rhinos today That's so amazing. rhinos have actually adapted to manas like they used to be there you know post 1990s and the wow. second phase will be burasapuri laukwa now another area where rhinos were there again due to social political you know unrest rhinos when you know were removed from there and very soon next year we will be starting another you know program where we will be stocking that place and you know That's you should keep your eggs in one basket actually you know so kaziranga is the hub 
orang yeah. and covid are somewhat nearby so we are, we want to saturate the population so that you know, in case something happens we still have you know eggs here and there yeah that's very interesting you know i mean the uh, rhinos are uh, highly poached of course we know even in africa they facing a problem do you feel it's as bad as there over here no here here i mean you know uh, here we did have an issue around uh, 2013 there was an issue but then yeah. the government took it up on them and the current regime has also taken it up on them and they have actually you know we haven't seen that much of you know poaching poaching i would poaching threat is there but yeah. the act of poaching has reduced the threat will always be there because you know if yeah. the chinese want the supply you know the demand has to be fulfilled yeah. but uh, other than that our boys are doing good you know they are they are keeping poaching at the minimum standards that's great to hear really and uh, what are the temporary measures taken by the government for wildlife conservation temporary i mean you know uh, look uh, temporary only in terms of uh, elephants they have taken because you know elephants for i mean i won't go into much more details i mean you know, elephant habitat is shrinking so yeah. government is trying to you know secure whatever is left of it and you know are trying to we use a lot of power fences now the solar power fences which is basically you know uh, we draw a fence a two hour three hour depending upon the i mean the ground and we these power fences actually you know prevent the elephant to an extent from coming into human habitats or coming into crop fields so these are some of the you know uh, temporary measures but we call it banded measures but these are banded measures to actually buy time for more intense scientific actions to come in and by the way we already delayed you know we need yeah. to go, you know we need to go about it quickly you know uh and in my introduction i said that you also uh, train dogs for anti poaching so i thought i'll take it up since we were talking about anti poaching right now so speak a little bit about this program that you are involved with in. yeah like i said i i am a shepherd person and there were dogs in the house and you know i used to show dogs and a few of the dogs that i showed already were shoot some train so i knew the basics of you know protection work and working dogs and then one fine yeah. i mean one day over a cup of coffee uh, another you know conservation colleague of mine he says hey since you do, since you know about dogs so much why don't we try to do something yeah. about you know use them for anti poaching work yeah. i said okay let me you know think about it so uh, i thought about it and then you know we zeroed into the belgian malinois and uh, those i mean this was back in uh, 2010 and 2010 11 okay hmm. Uh, hmm. so i got in touch with uh, mr masood who actually is one of the finest trainers in the country right now stealth paws and then he put me through dev lahiri and you know we picked up two dogs from there and then after that you know to condition them i had to learn a lot of things and right. as a result you know i knew uh, i mean i knew how to keep them reconditioned and then after that we mated these dogs and then we had puppies we started training them on their own but i i would like to put it on record that mr masood and mr dev lahiri has had a lot of you know influence on this and i thank them from the bottom of my heart today whatever dogs are in fact i have actually given dogs now to nepal you know to wwf oh, really? nepal has taken yet yeah. wwf nepal has so two dogs for anti poaching work and they are doing tremendous job and dogs have helped us you know we have we have actually you know thwarted more than more than 50 you know incidents we uh, wow. dogs have led to uh, the recovery of uh, weapons you know dog has led to the recovery of poachers and uh, you know we have had a good success actually with dogs and even wow. the, even the you know even the park managers are now very conf- confident with the work that our dogs do yeah we started off so, with two now we have eight wow okay So, so now you can see how success i mean you know how good these dogs are i mean i always say that you know these these dogs they're not only a man's best friend they're rhino's best friend too so how does it work so they they go patrol with the guards what do they do uh we we do patrolling we do border patrolling you know intrusion patrolling where you know the dogs can actually you know to certain extent indicate whether there has been intrusion on the fence line and oh, wow. whenever okay. there is an occurrence and then we go for even you know intruder patrolling uh and we also patrol the villages in and around the park areas yeah and even if, if there is if there is an occurrence and there is a lead when i say lead you know there is some uh there is some uh, uh product out there from where you know the dog can sniff we right. actually we actually used to track you know uh poachers we have been very yeah. successful and i mean uh, our success rate is over over 80% 
and uh, we have we have actually you know usually what happens is the poacher commits the crime and he goes away but we have been able to identify the safe houses from where the poacher operated we have wow. been able to identify you know places from where the weapons came in we have been able to identify places where the horn was dug and kept that's incredible just with the dogs yeah just with the dogs i mean, so I mean you know, it's, it's not only the dogs we, it's it's a buddy system the guy handling yeah. the dogs also has to you know know oh, when and how to work the dog and push the dog and also use his brains to actually interpret what the dogs want to say i'll i'll give you a very i'll give you a very small incident what happened was yeah uh, this was like uh, around 5 years back oran another you know another park where you know there are uh, rhinos yeah so there was a poaching incident and one staff had died Yeah. So our dog was in Kasiranga, and the dog was called in. So we sent a dog, and a handler. Then you know the handler, after you know tracking for an hour and a half, he was he called me up and he says, "Sir, this is you know this dog is actually going into this house, you know making a circle again coming out, and he's yeah. actually you know sniffing the person who is you know accompanying us." Yeah. So I told him that you know fall back and you know push the dog a bit. When we said push the dog, I said do it again. so every time he was doing it you know the dog was actually you know trying to grab the person who was uh, rather bite the person who was with us who was actually guiding us then at one point i mean you know belgian malis are actually very very you know uh, snappy dogs you know if they get to a object they will go for it you can't hold them you can't hold them if i mean you try to hold them they go for you so what we, i said that okay let's let, let's let's take a risk let us you know let let the dog lose Yeah. So we let the dog loose. The dog actually jumped on this uh, casual forest guard, and you know, uh, and this guy, this guy said, "Okay, I have shot the person." So this was the guy who actually shot his colleague to let the poachers have a you know safe escape, My and God. then he was later on caught and you know put into jail. That's incredible. Certified good boy. This, this, yeah, this is this is yeah. this is this is one incident which you know I. I mean, I I saluted my dogs. I mean, I was like, you know, I didn't. I even didn't know that they would be able to do this. Wow. No, I'm sure, like you said, you know, there's teamwork, but we are biased about dogs, so uh -huh. we certify that everybody has to work together. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, uh, it's incredible. So, what? How do elephants help with uh, anti poaching? They are also part of it. You train those also. no elephants i mostly i mean you know our private elephants now whatever i have are mostly used for entity predation drives like when i said you know elephants come into you know paddy fields we used to again yeah. you know push them away then i have yeah. another project another project where these these elephants are used to keep uh, away elephants from train tracks yeah. you know we have had a lot of yeah. you know train hit incidents so these elephants yes. are used for you know uh, keeping away wild herds from or making them safe crossly you know to and for the mm -hmm. track but the government elephant the park elephants you know th th those are like i i say that the rhino and the tiger the reason that they survive in kaziranga one of the reasons are elephants actually because get being on top of the elephants the staff actually can patrol roads and the staff can actually get into places where usually yeah. on foot it wouldn't have been possible right so i mean the elephants do help in the patrolling of the park and do help to actually maintain a balance uh, in terms of you know thwarting uh, and i mean poachers activities poaching activities no that's that's incredible really you know there's so many elements working together to uh, you know uh, it's heartening to hear about it when you're only hearing uh, you know bad news all the time so it's it's great i think you're doing some great work along with your team and the people that you work with so you know let's go through some pictures that uh, you have and you can tell us about the stories sure. behind them yeah what well, is this was the here? this was the recent rhino translocation where we actually you know translocated a mom and a mom and her baby from kaziranga national park to manas these are the crates that we use to actually wow. you know capture i mean transport these are transport crates crates and this is the release site this is how we release the rhino and you can see the mom coming out and uh, so this was the last uh, capture and transport i mean this was the last translocation which was around the first week of march this year i see if there's an elephant looking on and how many people are there doing this those are actually forest staff because you need a lot of people to actually you know pick this thing up yeah. because we have one crane which is doing the doing just one you know uh one door so another door was being manned by people 
there are elephants we keep the elephants so that the rhinos don't come into this way you know they go straight where they have to my god but this rhino actually you know i i opened the crates and i actually got onto the uh, crane so it actually smelled took my smell it came to the crane and bit a part of the tire and then ran away <laughs> i mean the crates are so huge like it's all the people are like currently saying all the humans are on the yes, crate yes the, the crates like, are huge and very strong it's made of you know iron angles and uh, wood made of around 2 inch thick you know sal planks which are very hard wood otherwise you know uh, you can't contain the rhinos inside they'll, they'll break yeah. it like my dog crates i only have some clothes on it like you know this is <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing amazing so where is the calf the calf already gone on the calf is actually you know this is the mom coming out the calf will come out yeah. a bit later actually this is the calf came out the a bit calf later was usually when the mom crate. yeah the second crate yes ah okay let's see the next one then oh, oh my this god was a, uh this was a rhino calf which we rescued uh around 2017 june july uh from pobitora it had you know separated from his mom and his mom was not taking it back so oh. we actually waded through around 3 feet of water and you know rescued this calf and we put it in the zoo where it's grown up now so tiny so, yeah it was it was barely a year old wow it's, it's so cute baby rhino i've never seen a rhino so tiny <laughs> you know uh, rhinos rhinos are i i would say are are very very uh funny animals you know i i love watching them because you know uh they're different they're, they're different yeah. from other animals actually yeah really like in terms of behavior they're like saint bernards okay they're very unpredictable actually <laughs> you know they would ram you without no rhyme or reason or they will just you know walk through you to walk past you I mean, probably when God made them, God, you know, God also didn't know. I mean, what they're going to do next? <laughs> wow. Okay. Then let's see. Oh my. Oh, these these are these are three of my elephants. This is the grandmother on the extreme left, then the calf, and then the mother. I mean, I keep on going to the camp almost every week because the calf is now yeah. two years old, and we are actually, you know, uh, teaching her basics. basic obedience because we are using now you know we are using a system of positive and negative reinforcement the same technique they use in horses we are trying okay. to do away with the traditional we are trying to do away with certain components of the traditional way of training and yeah. let's see what happens we have achieved good results let's see what happens in other years time so saloni wants to know what are their names and i also want to know what are they okay uh well this is oloka this this one belong to my dad actually okay the one you feeding then, you know the the one on the extreme uh, the the other one the other bigger one not the one that I'm feeding. okay okay on that is oloka's be uh, daughter rohila and that's uh -huh. rohila's baby kori and I'll, i'll tell you the story about why she has been named kori you know i'm uh -huh. i'm i'm member of iucn's asian elephant specialist group and from the us fish and wildlife uh, the the lady who's heading the elephant division out there her name is kori brown and okay. you know this was this was a meeting at uh, this was a meeting at uh, at bangkok the the asian elephant specialist group meeting at 2018 in bangkok and she knew that my elephant was expecting and she's like hey baru why don't you name your elephant i mean uh, i mean on on i mean same as my name i said fine yeah. then you know i said fine i'll i'll do that but you need to pour, pump in more money for elephants and you know rhinos in india she said i i'll do it as a small thing to do so i went ahead and named her kori <laughs> wow that's an interesting story and Oh, this happening? was this was this was a bull this was a gwalpara bull which we moved last year okay this this was an unfortunate incident because uh, you know gwalpara is an area let me talk to you about gwalpara gwalpara was a traditional elephant country okay and yeah. what happened was you know due to encroachment and human dominance now the elephant habitat out there is patchy defragmented patchy fragmented and yeah. degraded so elephants very often come out to the human habitat area human habitat areas to you know feed on crops Uh, unfortunately this this guy on i mean on a particular night i think it was 38 of october or 1st of november last year uh, yeah. it uh, for some reason actually you know came into contact with five people and those five people ended up dead within a span of around 12 hours so you know there was a, and and there is a herd of around 70 plus elephants out there and there have been records of you know electrocution and you know poisoning of elephants out there by the locals because of all this so we actually 
you know, uh, took this elephant. I mean, we moved this elephant from that area to another national park, so that mm -hmm. you know the local community out there is is you know cooled down, cools down, and says that fine, you have removed the elephant, so we won't do anything yeah. to the other yeah. elephants out there. And we removed this to a national park. So, do you know how he's doing, or no? He, he's doing fine. I mean, we have released him now. He's, he's doing fine. Yeah. You know, once elephants, you know, uh, we release the elephants. I mean, they are in an area. They, I mean, this was a bull. It did take some time to actually get into a herd because the herd was not, yeah, would not expect him directly because it's a bull from some other, you know, herd. Over yeah. a period of time, now the last that we knew that you know he had around two, three, you know, uh, two, three elephants around him. So he's also okay. now, you know, has a small sub herd with him. Right. Oh, this this is an interesting elephant. Uh, that's me. This elephant, I say interesting. Wow. This was this was in May. Uh, this was, I think, on first of May, two thousand nineteen. I mean, yeah. you know, Guwahati is a place where you have leopards, rhinos, and elephants. Okay, forty kilometers away from Guwahati, you have uh, rhinos, leopards. You have inside the city, and the whole area is surrounded by elephants. Mm. So this elephant, one afternoon, probably thought that you know he wants to see the city. And he actually left his habitat, walked through the military campus, walked through the core of Guwahati, and he was like, you know, it was like having an elephant in the middle of Connaught Place. Wow. So, and uh, and he had fed on a lot of pineapple, and he was kind of, you know, the yeast was acting on him, fermentation was happening, he was kind of drunk. Yeah. And I mean, but it was very nice. I would say he was a very nice elephant because he did not do a thing to anybody. Whatever we, I mean, whatever happened, happened to him, actually. We sedated him. Then we picked oh. him up. We actually couldn't sedate him in the first day because you know he was moving in an area where we did not find. I mean, the zoo veterinarians were not finding it comfortable to sedate him. So what yeah. we did was we actually drove the animal. We guided the animal to the zoo, oh. and we locked the gates. And there we sedated him. Then we picked him up and we released him from in an area from where he came out from. And this is not the first time he has done it. This is the second time he has done it. <laughs> so now we have put a radio collar in him, and we get to oh. know, you know. Where so you oh, so you redirect him back before he comes out. No, now what happens is we got a pre. I mean, we have a geo geo fence fence going on. So now what happens is moment comes yeah. in, you know, on the app, you know, the forest department on their app, yeah. they get a notification that this elephant is nearby. So we have the, the, they yeah. position their people. Then we have our volunteers, you know, position out there. So when this elephant tries to come in, he's very happy. He's yeah. very habituated with humans around him. So you know, we create a we you know we bang plates, we burst trackers, then he again goes in. <laughs> So is he like kind of sedated here? How is he standing so? Yeah, he's, he's sedated here because you know uh, I just opened the after the lights. I mean, we had given him reversal, so it takes around you know five to six minutes for the drugs to actually you know act on him and get his sedation reversed. So oh, okay. I just came and I released those you know uh, those straps that you use. Those straps were actually used to pick him up and you know bring him down. Yeah. So I used those. Uh, I opened the straps and I was slowly getting away from him. Ah, oh, okay. Very interesting. Saloni wants to know: Do you know name these animals too? His name was Ganesh. I mean, I mean, you know, his his the forest department named him Ganesha. He's still been named there, Jay Ganesh. <laughs> cute, so cute. So, but not all of them, just because he's a character, a bit of a character. Yeah, he. he I know. We we have. I mean, you know, where with the place where I work in Deport Bill, like you know, yeah. we. In in the local language, we 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 have you know we name the elephants which are troublesome like broken tusk, short tail, you know, uh, kan kata means the ear is cut. <laughs> wow. Okay. And then. Oh, this is this is the army area in Guwahati, and uh, the army area in Guwahati, one portion of it lies near the um, is actually right adjacent to the Amchang Wildlife Sanctuary, and okay. this is the FAOD, the army. Uh, ammunition dump and you know they have this water reservoirs for safety and uh, but yeah. they allow the elephants to come in the army people are you know uh, have been very good with the with the elephants they say they they've kept one you know passage open from where elephants can come in and yeah. you know get in and get out but sometimes what happens you know uh, i mean elephants are very elephants love water you know and right. sometimes what happens is the, the calf jumps into it i can't get out the mom jumps into it and then both of them can't get out this was a situation where the calf and the mom had got in so what we did was, you know, uh, we actually, uh, I mean, I haven't shown you the whole thing. We actually pumped the water out. Oh. And then we pumped the water out. We sedated the mom. We picked up the, you know, mom first. And then we uh, we secured the uh, calf. 
And by the time the mom was being reversed, we picked up the calf and put it near the mom. And then they reunited and walked into the forest. So how long uh, do they stay sedated for? Like, You know, it depends upon the veterinarian's, uh, you know, administration of the drugs. I mean, it depends around an hour, hour and a half, depending upon, you know, so what is our work. So you observe them till they come out and leave? Pardon? So you stay with them till they come out of sedation? And yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, we, we need to stay because the veterinarian needs to see that the reversal is totally done, you know, otherwise, right. you know, there can right. be issues. Yeah. I mean, usually, I mean, I mean, in, in probably 100 incidents we have had, you know, in 100 occasions, we have had one incident where we needed okay. to actually, you know, pump it up with some more medicines to get it going. Other than that, these are very safe drugs, which the R veterinarians have been using over the ages and they're very yeah. used to it. Right. So, I mean, it must be tough, you know, like for anesthesia, for even dogs, humans, they calculate body weight, this, that, and these vets are just... I mean, I mean you know, I have great respect for, you know, great See? respect for wildlife vets, especially, you yeah. know, vets like Bhaskar Chaudhary, vets like Samsul, vets like KK Sharma. You know, they go out of their way to learn, you know, because India have, yeah. India doesn't have wildlife vets per se. Right. So they have learned in the process, you know, they have learned, they've educated themselves and now they yeah. know the, they have standardized the doses. I mean, hats off to them. Incredible to just eyeball it and make sure their animal is fine, you know. That's yes. Incredible. This looks very interesting. There's a chopper also in this picture. What's going on here? Yeah, uh, this was this was a zebra which uh, was dark. This is a mountain zebra. You know, it's a bit different from the normal zebra. This is this is uh, in the uh, mountain zebra national park, South Africa. And I was oh, working okay. with the Kruger National Park guys, and then we darted this uh, zebra from the helicopter. And this is Dr. Janice. She's taking out uh, blood samples to do a DNA study. Because we wanted to find out there's, there's a very small population of the mountain zebras on, in, on that particular you know range so we wanted right. to find out whether you know uh there was some inbreeding amongst the animals so we had sedated the animal to take the you know sampling for the dna test so why i mean uh, uh, i think this is the end of our picture but i'm going to talk to you a little bit about your time in south africa as well so very interesting uh, photos kaushik really uh, pleasure looking at them so Tell us how did you end up in South Africa and what were you doing there and how was it? 2004 was the first time I ended up in South Africa. Uh, the reason I ended up in South Africa because you know I that was a mecca of capture, right? And and right. you know elephants were being rescued. For rescuing elephants, you needed to capture the elephant first, you know, to restrain right. it and you know secure restrain and evacuate. So yeah. I said, you know, I thought what better you know uh, place than to go to South Africa and learn it. So yeah. I. Uh, the first time I worked was uh, with not with, he was an ex Cougar vet. I mean, uh, Do Gobler. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to him and he says, I said, can I come and work with you people? He says, what's your background? Yeah. I said, this, this, this. He said, okay, you can come, but you know, you have to go through a veterinary field assistance, you know, course. I said, fine, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. So I went there, I spent around 90 days. I learned, you know, I learned modern capture techniques. I learned drugs. I'm, I'm not authorized to use drugs, but I learned. I mean, South Africans, if yeah. you, in South Africa, if you are a veterinary field assistant, they allow you to you know, learn about drugs and yeah. i learned about the equipments the methods of evacuation in case the animal was compromised in an in a i mean it was compromised in a situation how to actually bring the animal back from there and i came yeah. and you know i actually and then we pulled the resource the veterinarians asked we pulled the resources together we started supporting the forest department and now we have one of the best rescue teams in the country incredible that's incredible so how I mean, the first time i did was first time was you know we shifted uh I shifted around eight elephants from Pinda, which is a man-made, you know, national park of okay. Durban. And okay. we shifted eight elephants. We caught eight elephants and we shifted it from Pinda. Pinda had too many elephants. So we translocated eight elephants from Pinda ah. to Sabi Sand. Sabi Sand is near Kruger, which was, uh, yeah. which, which is Branson's, you know, uh, I mean, uh, safari park. So we yeah. shifted there. There I even shifted Rowan antelopes. I, I shifted uh, white lip, I mean, square lip, white rhinos. Then warthog zebras, but 2013-14 uh, when I went, when I was actually into the core of capture, you know, I was working alongside with uh, uh, the Kruger National Park, one you know, of wildlife veterinary services. I'm right. Dr. Mark of my was there's a great vet, and I learned. I mean, 80 percent of my knowledge came then. Interesting, like really. I mean, 
and you did all this on your own out of your own initiative your desire to learn about this yeah the first time 2004 you know i asked my dad and he says fine you know go ahead even when i was your age i did whatever i wanted he says go yeah. i said for 90 days so i mean yeah i mean my wife actually fit the bit but then she was like you know it's no use keeping him i mean you go spend 90 days and come back <laughs> No, that's really that's amazing. What an experience it must have been. Seriously. No, I I tell this to people. You know, if you follow your heart. You know, yeah. Like I I was uh, you know, I my my line of education was different. My line of work was different. But I feel that you know since I can do this, I might as well do this because there are very few people doing this. Yeah. So. So and but, those who have been given the chance better do it. No, but what would you say to young? people or young viewers who are watching you know, if they want to get into this wildlife conservation and what should they do because i don't know if there's uh, you know enough mentors out there or people like how do you get into it really look uh, i mean i i would say everybody everybody can play a role in conservation you know yeah in, yeah i mean wildlife is a bit different but everybody can actually you know even if you switch off the light that's conservation uh, this is something which I tell my, you know, whenever I go to my daughter's school for, you know, to interact with her classmates or, you know, her school friends and stuff like that. I, I tell them something that, you know, everybody can actually become a conservationist. Uh, yeah. Wildlife conservation is a different thing, of course. You can be a veterinarian. You can be a zoologist. Yeah. Even if you're a banker, you know, you can actually help conservation. You know, bankers, I mean, the NGOs get a lot of money from banks to do their activities. Like, you know, I have a friend, I have a friend who is into the legal profession and this guy actually knows the Wildlife Act by heart. So whenever there's a poaching case, he actually helps the government, you know, fight the case. Right. So, and then, you know, we have, uh, I mean, I have a few friends who are now cops, you know, who, who are in the police. So mm -hmm. now when we get information and these guys and we pass it on to them and they act, you know, everybody, a banker, yeah. policeman, you know, a doctor, like, I mean, just two days back, you know, there was a, around, around 80 kilometers from Guwahati, a uh, man was injured by an elephant. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so he was sent, I mean, he was really patched. I mean, I, I didn't want to put the photograph. He had 66 stitches going through his head. My so, God. you know, I, I sent him, I called another senior of mine who's a doctor. And I told him that, you know, can anything be done about it? He said, no, just send him across. I'll patch him up for free. So that's you know that's that's conservation. I mean, this 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 is a poor man. You know, he's he's yeah. he's a poor person. He wouldn't have the money to actually you know treat himself. But this the senior yeah. of mine actually took it on him to patch him up, and I even gave some money to him today and sent him home. Yeah. So everybody can help you know conserve. Yes, wildlife. If you really want to get into wildlife, you know, uh, well the thing is study. I mean, you know, like I I started you know uh, I was I'm an MBA and then I got into this. So study will study doesn't matter if you have the heart, you can even go go in. But I, there are courses, you know, you want to become a veterinarian, you do yeah. a vet course, you want to be a conservationist, you do an ecology course. Unfortunately, in India, you know, there is a problem. There's, I mean, there are a lot of, there's, there's negligible courses in the BS and in the bachelor's level. Yeah. So that needs to be, the government needs to come out with these, you know, conservation and ecology courses for the you know, bachelor's degree. Right. Yeah, because I don't think, you know, uh, like, I mean, it's very interesting what you said, uh, because... Uh, we don't think about uh, all these other professions, like you said, you know, when we think about wildlife and how we can contribute. I mean, sure, uh, you know, we are responsible wildlife tourists, you know, maybe contribute to the right organizations. But how even a lawyer, how even a regular doctor or cops, you know, they can play a role. So no matter what you're doing, you can, uh, you know, step up and uh, be a part yeah. of this good network for the conservation, right? So, like I said, you know, everybody is a conservationist. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. you, I, the people who are actually, you know, on the other side, everybody. Yeah. It's just you need to have the heart for it. Go ahead and do it. Right. No, thank you. Thank you. That was very, very informative, very interesting. And, uh, you know, you had a great life, I would say, surrounded by all these animals. And then you went out on your own and gained more experience about it. So really, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for, uh, you know, changing the approach to elephant training and for relocating those rhinos. And really, it's been an this honor. Is to all, this is all teamwork. I'm a small part of it. I do my job. Other people do their job. And as a result, the work gets done. 
Dr. Kaushik, thank you. Thank you for being with us on Talks for today. It was I a pleasure having you. having me here. And, you know, I also enjoy. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe. You too. So, guys, uh, that was a very interesting session. So, in case you ever wanted to contribute to wildlife, you know, there are a lot of organizations out there that you can support. Also, visit our national parks. We have a lot of national parks. You know, your money helps in these conservation aspects. And be a responsible tourist when you go to our national parks. So, thanks for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.